Buenas noches. ¿Cómo están todos? ¿Hay alguien aquí que, que habla en español? Algunos. Ay, qué bueno, qué bueno. Mira, fue pues, ¿qué si yo les dije que ustedes son el segmento solamente que estoy hablando esta noche y te voy a dar información imperativo que hay un fuego afuera y hay solamente una salida que puede salir. Pueden esca escapar. Sí, sí pueden, porque me entiende, ¿verdad? Oh, oh, forgive me. Oh, my goodness, that is so rude. You didn't understand me, did you? That's kind of what it feels like to be in poverty. It's very, very confusing. If you don't have an interpreter or a role model or a mentor, you do not understand the hidden rules of middle class and social classes. And so what I told them was that there's a fire outside. What if I told them there was a fire outside? They would be the only handful that would survive because I was telling them to exit that door right there. And see, that's really how it is in poverty as well. If you don't have anybody to tell you what to do, to explain to you, you really have no chance for survival. It's very confusing. You're disoriented, bewildered, constant state of confusion. And... Uh, It's pretty chaotic. So sort of my poverty Bible is uh, a book by Ruby Payne called uh, A Framework for Understanding Poverty. And um, she explains poverty as, um, well, she, she says that people in poverty never learn the secret hidden language of middle or social classes, which is the mother tongue of school, business, and largely the world. Um, she, she defines it as, the extent to which people do without resources. So like, it's not just financial, for instance. It's emotional, mental, spiritual, physical, support systems, right? If you have all those, you're really, really wealthy. But chances are, you could be lacking in one of those areas, and you would be in poverty, so to speak, in that area. So uh, also, knowledge of the hidden rules of a certain class is also a resource. We know that poverty is experienced both generationally, the child's born in poverty, they live in poverty, constant state of hopelessness, hopelessness has children, child born in poverty, you know, the cycle continues. But it also happens situationally, and that's the bigger issue. Um, a person goes through a divorce, for instance. What happens to the children? Children who are products of a divorce are, I think the statistics are something like 90% more likely to live in poverty. It's a staggering statistic. Death can cause a poverty. If I have a coworker, her husband died, two weeks later her father died. Now see, the, part of, the other part of that is that she had no children, so it was just her and her husband, And her dad was her only parent. She had no brothers and sisters. So what do you think happened in her world, right? She's in poverty. She has no resources. She has nobody that she used to talk to before and converse with or get that resource from. Big one, teen suicide. Kids in school today, they have nobody to, to talk to or to associate with. What if they're struggling with anorexia or drug use? Um, homosexuality, who are they going to talk to about those things? They can't because people give them labels if they do. And it's very frightening for them. And it causes a poverty. And sometimes they die. So one of my heroes is a little boy I met while working in a school. His name is Brandon Detter. And um, he's a cancer fighter. He's a survivor. He's had cancer since he was about five years old, and he's now 12. And um, I can bet you that their life is turned upside down and very impoverished because he spends his life in the hospital day in and day out. He doesn't get to go to school and be with his friends or his family or his parents. And I bet you they spend a lot of gas going back and forth to Arnold Palmer. And so to give you an example, my mom was one of nine children born to alcoholic parents. So what that kind of looks like is this. That's a lot of feet. That's a lot of shoes, right? 
Um, so she didn't have many happy stories to tell me, but this, this caused a generational, this was a generational poverty, and it was also a situational poverty. She was just born into it. She didn't ask for it. But Ruby Payne describes escaping poverty one of four ways. And as my daughter so eloquently put it, you can wiggle free. So one way is to marry out of it, and that's what my mom did. So do any of you know who this is? No? Doesn't look familiar? This is Samuel Colt, and he invented this little device. You may have seen it. The Colt revolver. How about this guy? Do you know who that is? <laughs> no, <laughs> but close. Johns Hopkins. And what did he do? This is an uh, audience participation with me, so it's, it's good. Um, so he founded Johns Hopkins Hospital and Johns Hopkins University. Samuel Colt was related to my father on my grandfather's side. And on my grandmother's side, Johns Hopkins. So he came from this really great lineage of wealth of lot of, in a lot of ways. And, um, and I thought it was interesting that Johns Hopkins Hospital was built to, in his will it stated, to treat the poor of this city and state of all races and cultures. This was at the time the largest bequest in U.S. history. I thought that I came by that sort of naturally, I guess. So what about this? Do you know what this is? Anybody know what that is? The Mayflower, right. The Mayflower. That's a very important ship because without that ship and the people who survived that first winter, I would not be here because I have the documents that trace my lineage back to the Mayflower, which makes me an honorary Mayflower Society member, whatever that means. And um, it's actually a pretty great honor. To, I shouldn't take it lightly, but... Um, but also, it makes me a daughter of the Revolution, which is people who can trace their lineage back to the Revolutionary War. So not many people can do that. I can do that. My kids can do that. Um, so I also had the originals of the photos. I looked those up online, and then I had an, one of those Cinderella, wait, I have the other slipper moments, um, that I had the original pictures of Samuel Colt and Johns Hopkins. So those sort of became a precious commodity right then and there the other day. Um, so with that lineage, how does it happen that one would grow up poor? That just doesn't equate. It doesn't make sense. But through choices my dad made and his own, what I call spiritual and emotional poverty, we were abandoned. We were alone, and many times we were really ashamed. Because it was the early to mid-70s, and it wasn't like today where you could just walk out there and get a job, right? You can't do, well, more or less, you, you couldn't. Women didn't work. And my mom didn't even have a high school education. So she really wasn't going to get a job, especially if this was the protocol for getting a job. She wasn't any of those things. So we were hungry a lot. We were evicted a lot. We didn't have basic needs met a lot. And if you think I was worried about food, I'm going to tell you what I was really worried about when I became a teenager. I had two sisters and my mom. And this may, you know, get a little personal, but there's something that happens to teenage girls that isn't going to stop. And you need to have basic necessities for that because you just, life just doesn't stop. So forget about food. We were homeless. And it was pretty horrible. Ruby Payne cites four reasons that one leaves poverty. And I love it because she puts vocabulary to it. I just love it. It's too painful to stay. That's number one. Number two, a vision or a goal. Number three, a key relationship, a mentor, a role model, a teacher, education, I like to call it. My mom had one, uh, a special talent or skill. So my mom, um, my sister has a ruptured appendix, and so she goes to the emergency room and she tells the doctor, I can't pay for this. I don't know what I'm going to do, but my kid's going to die. And the doctor, you know what he does? He rips up the bill and he 
does the surgery for free, and he gives my mom a job and training. Now, that would sort of solve some of the mental and the stress that I cannot even put into words for you of what she must have gone through. But um, she still bought with her the, 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 the rules from which the class, the class in which she grew up in. You know, everybody, even though they move along class lines and they may come out of poverty, they still have all that, well, some people like to call it baggage, but I like to call it the rules of the class in which they grew up. So let's sort of change that vocabulary. So if she had had a significant mentor, and I am so thankful I have so many, she wouldn't have made the next decision she did, and that was she loaded all of us up and moved to Florida. And uh, I was the new girl in town in middle school and high school, and that was my home. We lived in that car. Poverty is, is loud. It's chaotic. There's no coping strategies. There's nobody teaching you procedures and how to do things. And so when you go to school and you don't know how to do those things because you don't speak that language, you're weird. There's no, there's no other way to say it. So how did I break free? Well, first I had role models, my aunt and my grandmother on my father's side. They didn't speak the language of poverty, but I just watched everything they did. And I realized that there was no chaos in their life. There wasn't screaming, yelling, they had food, they had a dad, it was awesome. And they had lots of food and they shared. And that's what role models do. They give tirelessly. The second, I had a set of special skills, or as Oz would say, my child, you have one thing they haven't got. Do you remember what this guy wanted? What'd she want? Yeah, she wanted to go home. And so I had all those things inside me. Um, and so I just didn't know it yet. So to put it in more modern terms, I was divergent. I had all the factions. I just, I love that. If you didn't see that movie, go see it. Um, I had all the factions, and I, I just didn't know it yet. I was divergent. I'm still learning it now, actually. So, and the other thing I did was at 14, I begged for my first job. I really wanted a job bad. I had to have uh, clothes for high school. I had to look good, right? So what poverty does is it, it robs you emotionally, it robs you mentally, it robs you physically, it leaves you feeling like an empty shell. It stunts your emotional growth and you value yourself very, very little. You feel like that a lot. So in poverty, a lot of people, you'll make judgment calls on the things they do and they learn to depend on other resources for survival like Ursula tells uh, the Little Mermaid, don't underestimate the importance of body language. And so they rely on things like sex and manipulation techniques and all outer things. They're nothing, they're nothing internal. There's no internal assets because they don't feel anything. So what I did was I married out of it. I had a successful and promising banking career. I married a man who um, was private school educated. He was college educated. And um, the only poverty he really had is when he came here, he didn't speak another language. But that was great for me, because how many of you took a foreign language in high school? Raise your hand. Do you, how many of you speak it now? Put your hands down. <laughs> well, that's, I met him right after high school. So I got to use it. And that's why I speak it today. And that came in very handy. And I'm going to show you why in a minute. So I had a successful banking career. And I had four beautiful children who are now 20, 17, 15, and 11. And I left my career to be with them. No matter what life throws at me, at least I don't have ugly children. <laughs> Sorry, that's horrible. 22 years later, <laughs> I discovered a little secret. My husband was waking up every day putting on an act. Every day. I could do this for like 22 years. I'd like to show you every day. That's a lot of like 365, if you think about me clicking that. He woke up and I, I was, I woke up and I was unwittingly paying the supporting role in his act. And this is gonna bother some people, it should. It should bother you in a lot of ways and I'm hoping it bothers you in the right way. He was gay and there is no other way to say that. And it caused a huge situational poverty in my life. 
I cannot even tell you what it's like to care for four kids when every day you're getting up and you haven't slept all night because you're you just there's no words to tell you how that feels you're puking your guts out and you drop 25 pounds on the divorce diet plan just like that and I can't lose 25 pounds but I did and um, so you know my kids were going through their own emotional things and uh, I couldn't I couldn't care for them. You know, I was alone I had no family here I had no resources my grandmother had died years before and um, my church friends didn't know what to do most people didn't know what to do so I found out who my real friends were pretty quick and uh, you notice every time through this talk I say something happens I did something something happens I did something this time what did I do I had a skill after 22 years and I was able to speak another language so this worked out pretty well for me because I could get a job making eight dollars an hour um, as an ESOL paraprofessional and I was the one in the learning role found out kids aren't in, unintelligent or poor just because they don't speak English and just because they don't have finances that didn't make them poor either and just because they didn't have parents that didn't make them poor either now, I learned a lot about emotional poverty it has the highest probability of robbing any other wealth you have so if you're wealthy in any of those other areas I said and your emotional pot, uh, wealth is really low you need to take care of that because it will rob you you might turn to drugs or alcohol it's going to take away your pretty face you might even get fired you might even not have money because you got fired you could lose your home if you don't have money you can lose your family if you don't have a home so what did I do I sat in one of those for a very long time and I'm not ashamed to say it and she was also a Stetson graduate and I built up my emotional wealth because that's the only way I could do it and take care of my kids so now you know what poverty really looks like if you're healthy financially take care of somebody who isn't because they really need you to if you're mentally well your spiritual pool is full you're physically wealthy you got support systems knowledge of upper middle class rules you got role models hey you know what you got a lot if you do it's not political it's not economic yes I am taking my pants off I really am don't worry I have other pants underneath it but it's not just the people in poverty or the economics or the, the arguments that people want to have about it that's ludicrous it's the thoughts of people who aren't in poverty that people in poverty are dirty and that people in poverty are unintelligent so I looked at my aunt my, as a role model and I kept my goals moving forward and I finally graduated in 2012 same year my daughter graduated from high school and I got a job here at Stetson University I work with great bosses and co-workers some of the best actually like the Oliphants and people I cannot even tell you how much work they do here it's unbelievable and I got my I am also a student so I'm pursuing my MBA at the same time I work here with really great people they also give me time for professional development which wipes out poverty and my kids can go to school for free how great is that can you have it any better than that so what I want to say is and I realize I just did something to my mic is value the internal assets of all people because you never know what they're going through and I challenge you it's not enough to just be significant I think you got to be divergent thank you